Hey, Clint, thank you so much for taking the time to join us for the Music Business Dreams podcast. I appreciate you, man. Yeah, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. No problem. So for those of us, those of uh, the audience members who may have just learned who you are, uh, just from me reading your bio a second ago, why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Yeah, so um, I'm a, a musician first, was kind of uh, born and raised around a bunch of musicians, singers, um, grew up in the church. So that's kind of where uh, I got started with music, just being a musician um, and playing and gigging. And then um, I'll say around 15, 16 years old is when I kind of got fascinated with the whole process of production and creating a, a song um, from beginning to end. Um, and just taking an idea and, and turn it into a full record. Um, so that's kind of when I started, you know, down the production lane around 15, 16. And then from there, um, just kind of grew and, and stayed on that path. Um, eventually started my production company before finishing college and then just continued on and ultimately moved to Atlanta after college. And yeah, man, just been been doing it since. Got you. So you started out doing production and you've kind of, you seem to be a lot more known for sync licensing now. Um, why sync licensing? <clears throat> so um, I don't know. Sync licensing, I kind of just, I kind of just fell into it. I had a buddy, a college buddy of mine, um, Rob, and he kind of introduced me to the idea while we were in college because we used to kind of link up. I would play keys on some of his tracks and he was just like, yo, you need to check out, you know, just producing music for TV and film. And I was just like, ah, oh, that's that seemed cool. But I never really took the time to really dig into it. So um, upon coming to Atlanta, I came to Atlanta and was was working and grinding, trying to make records for major artists and things like that. You know, ended up getting a couple placements, major placements, uh, Tamar Braxton and Case and, and Dondria Nicole um, and a few other artists. And um, during that time, it, I don't know, like it just felt like there was a lot of in between time when pinch it, pitching to to major artists and then i started to see success uh, from a publisher i was working with at the time on the sync side um so a lot of like tv placements fox sports and nfl network and stuff started to roll in and i was just like yo like it seems like i don't have to spend as much time you know trying to find out you know what these artists are working on trying to read a and r's minds and things like that mm -hmm. um so i just started to see a lot a lot of success on the sync side so i'm the type of person where it's like okay if i see i'm having success in a certain area i'm going to continue down that that path and just capitalize off of that and do more of that and see where it takes me. And um, it's been an amazing journey after getting my first couple of TV placements um, through the, the first publishing deal I had. Um, I decided to just to kind of go on this journey that I call like the road to 10 placements. And pretty much I set out to do whatever I had to do to get, you know, 10 TV film placements in within a year's time. And it, it actually took me a little over a year, um, but it was a great learning ex experience. And, you know, I developed a lot of relationships through that process. And yeah, man, I, I've, I never look back. Like I, I enjoy it and it's just, yeah, man, I love it. <clears throat> Got you. And so this road to 10 placements, how long ago did that start? Uh, that was around, let's see, I want to say about 2015, something like that. Okay. And how long would you say it took before you felt like, okay, I've got my bearings. I know what I'm doing right now. Yeah, I'd say it was a solid, it was a solid year or two because the thing with, with music licensing or sync licensing is you do a lot of work up front and you mm -hmm. don't necessarily see the results from that. So you don't know that stuff is out there getting placed because a lot of the publishers, they just don't have time to reach out to everybody. So it was about a year and a half, two years before I even knew like, yo, this stuff I'm producing is actually landing and, and working for me. Um, so it, it took, it took a, a solid two years to, to know like, okay, I'm on the right track. I know, you know, what the formula is. I know what structure they're looking for. And I know the vibe that they like. And then once I, once I kind of dialed in on that, um, you know, I, I was able to, to really use my time productive and know like, okay, I'm making this specifically for TV and placement. And I know it's going to have, you know, a, a pretty high chance of getting used. 
Got you. So let's back up for a second for those of us in the audience who may not know fully. Um, what is sync licensing or music licensing? <clears throat> so music licensing is just, um, you know, a, a TV show or a movie, something with picture, you know, using your music and putting it to picture pretty much. Mm-hmm. And as a composer or, you know, a, a songwriter, a producer, you own, you know, the rights to that composition, you own the rights to that master. So there has to be a license um, purchased for them to put your music to that picture. Um, So that's all it is in in a a general sense. Um, So, you know, a lot of times, I mean, if you just turn on the TV or or turn on a movie, go through Netflix, everything on there, you're going to hear music on. And that's what music licensing is, is supplying music for all of the content on Netflix, for all of the content on, on cable networks and, and movies and things like that. And even even YouTube, you know, smaller mediums. So yeah, that's what it is. Gotcha. So when you decide, okay, sync licensing is something I want to go for, you know, you, like you said, you may have kind of stumbled on a couple of placements early on, mm-hmm. but when you decide, okay, I want to be deliberate about this and try to replicate some of this success, what were some of the steps you took? What was some of the research you may have had to do? Yeah. So uh, first starting out, a lot of the research I was doing was was looking up like music libraries, music publishers or companies that focused on pitching music for TV and film. There's a lot of publishers out there. Um, and, you know, you have the publishers who may focus on, you know, getting your music and in, in advertising. You have publishers who may focus on, you know, major label placements. Um, but I was looking for publishers or music licensing companies that focus on TV and film placements. Um, so I would get on Google, just do a search, music licensing companies, easiest way to get started and just start, you know, reach, going to the websites, reaching out to the companies, seeing what music they use a lot, seeing what they place a lot of, um, just reaching out to them, asking them, hey, you know, what do you, are you looking for new composers? And, you know, they'll let you know if they are and, and how to submit and things like that. So a lot of the a lot of the work with in that first year of me starting out, you know, pursuing this this path, it was just me reaching out to as many licensing companies and publishers as I could. Like every day I would I would try and hit up at least five every day for uh, man, I say for a solid month or so I was mm-hmm. doing that um, just to start building that momentum and and starting to you know, get my music in as many buckets as possible. Got you. So I imagine, you know, with placing music or trying to place music to film and TV, there's a lot of rejection. Mm-hmm. How, did, how did you get over that to just keep pushing forward until you got, got that yes? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, before I, I decided to, to, to focus on music licensing, I would say, I mean, about three years before that, um, you know, I, I went out to LA, paid for conferences for TV and Sync, and um, nothing, nothing was ready. You know, I had critiques and things like that, but I didn't have the structure down. The music quality wasn't down. My like, I was focused on producing. Kind of, it was like my own sound, but it wasn't like mainstream. It wasn't what they what they want, what they hear. You know, kind of on the radio, they want to create the vibes of the hits and stuff like that. So. Mm. I didn't have that down. So I heard a lot of no's starting out, but I guess what kept me going was I knew I, I, I knew I was gifted. I knew I had a skill. I can produce music. I can play by ear. I can play, you know, pretty much anything that I hear. It's just a matter of figuring out what they're looking for, figuring out that formula. Um, and I'm just the type that I, I don't give up. If I know I can do something, I'm going to keep, keep trying and keep going until I get it right. And then once I get it right, like I'm a really, really, you know, go hard at it. So mm. that's, that's what that's what kept me going. But yeah, a lot of no's at first. Got you. So and you kind of alluded to a couple of mistakes that you made early on. What would you say are some of the top mistakes that either you made or other people <clears throat> who are trying to license their music make early on? Yeah, the top mistakes is is how you reach out to people, how you reach out to these companies. Um, a lot of people, man, they just, they spam. They want to flood your, your email inbox up with MP3s and WAV files. Um, but I, I find a lot of music supervisors, a lot of um, publishing companies or licensing companies, they, they don't want that. They, they have certain ways they like things submitted. Each one has their own system. And you have to abide by that. You know what I mean? You have to ask for permission. You want it to be, 
solicited, you know what I mean? So mm-hmm. you have permission to, to send music. So that's why I always encourage people, ask them if they're even looking for composers, because sometimes they're not, they're just not accepting submissions. Um, it doesn't mean your music isn't good, but it's, they're just not looking right now. Mm-hmm. So you can't take that personal. I've seen people kind of take that personal and think, oh, it's a, you know, a reflection of the music. It's not, you got to be patient, take your no graceful. And I think the second biggest mistake um, it's just not knowing exactly how to the structure instrumentals for for producers specifically. Songs is usually you make a song if the song works, um, you know they'll kind of they'll use which section they want to use. But mm-hmm. for background cues, I do a lot of like reality TV show stuff, loving hip hop, like the instrumental cues on there. There's usually a certain structure that those editors want to work with. Um, it's not just a three, four minute track. A lot of times I'm doing 60 second, a minute and, and a half um, with a sting ending, which is, that just means, you know, it's just a hard button ending. It just ends on on a single note, mm-hmm. um, no fade outs, things like that. So that would be like the second biggest thing is just really getting that structure down. Gotcha. Um, where did you learn, where do you learn the structure? Is it just from taking cues from those, those uh, publishers or those supervisors? <laughs> Yeah, a lot of times when when you are accepted, uh, I, I know I had one publisher where he just told me like, you know, cut this down in half and then add a sting in it. And then he would send me an example of that mm-hmm. or he would send me reference tracks. Sometimes when you get briefs, you'll get reference tracks. I listen to those reference tracks and I study them. You know, I break down each section like what is it? What is it doing? OK, a new instrument is being introduced here or you know the drums are dropping out here just different things um that you can kind of pick up on if you listen and listen and listen and then you know eventually you kind of get a grasp of of what it is got you so um in keeping with that line um what do you think are the some of the things that make a song syncable so to speak um so for from a song perspective like a full song with lyrics one of the main things is, I think, uh, general subject matter or, or something that's open and, and relatable and not super specific. Sometimes if you get super specific with lyrics, like, you know, you're saying sh- specific street names and city names and people's mm-hmm. names yeah. instead of just saying her or here, we in the city, you know, we having fun, I'm living life, things like that. Um, I, I think those tend to work well. Um, topics about love, topics about heartbreak, topics about having a good time, partying, you know, everything. Like the things that people want to hear, the thing, even if you just watch a movie, just listen to the songs and you'll, you'll get an idea of the subject matter that they use a lot. And a lot of times um, you see a lot of upbeat stuff get placed mm-hmm. a lot as well. Got you. So it sounds like upbeat tracks, upbeat music, um, universal themes, things that, mm-hmm. uh, you know, a lot of people can resonate with at once. Exactly. Um, as far as full songs. So when it comes to compositions, what do you think are some of the things that make your music stand out to a supervisor? Uh, I would say still the the upbeat tempo stuff, mid tempo upbeat stuff gets placed a lot. I don't get a whole lot of placements on slow tracks. If mm. if I do, I, I've, I've had a few of like some slow dramatic hip hop kind of cues mm. on, on TV, but not a lot. It's it's mostly the the mid to up tempo um, stuff that that gets placed a lot. Got you. Mm-hmm. So if someone wants to try to license their music for TV or film, what are some of the things they have to have together? Um, whether that's like joining a PRO or um, registering their music, what types of things do you think, how, how do you get your eggs in, in a row, your ducks in a row before yeah. you start submitting to some of these things? Uh, so you definitely want to be registered with a, a PRO, performing rights organization. Um, so BMI, CSAC, ASCAP, um, and I know there's others depending on where you're at in the, in the world. Um, but that is going to be a must um, before you even usually before you even sign a deal with a, a publisher or music licensing company. They're going to ask you, you know, for that that IPI number or it's going to be on the contract where you have to put that in. And that IPI number is provided, you know, excuse me, by your pro. Um, so you want to have that you want to be registered. Um, a, a lot of times the publisher 
we'll register it, register the track for you on your behalf. Um, but just ask them, you know, make sure you understand who's responsible for, for registering the tracks because you want to make sure they're registered. If they're not, you won't get your performance royalties. Um, so mm-hmm. you have music out there and it's just, it's making money, but you won't see it. So it's just mm-hmm. it's sitting there and then it goes in some black box royalties that gets paid off to the big artists. So you don't right. want that to happen. Gotcha. Yeah. And then, um, that uh, ki- honestly, that's kind of the the main thing. I would say have a uh, you know something like a, a Dropbox or a, a Box dot com or something to to share files. Um, again, that's going to depend on the publisher, or the licensing company. They have different guidelines, but something to just make it easy where they can they can stream it, they can share your music. Also, have kind of like a demo reel together, five five to ten tracks. So when you do reach out and say, "Hey, are you accepting submissions or new composers?" and they they're going to ask you, you know, to hear some of your work. You want to have kind of like a demo reel together, showing what you're capable of, because they they're going to want to hear if if you can do what you say you can do. Right. Now you mentioned earlier, um, just for your personal journey, um, having a publishing deal at one point. Do you find it's better to, you know, for music licensing to submit, you know, with to a music publisher and get things placed that way? Or have you had better success doing it independently? Or what do you think are the pros and cons of those methods? So the the first publishing deal I had was it was an exclusive publishing deal, meaning everything I did had to go through them. So whether it was artists, TV whatever. Well, I couldn't even submit to other publishers. Like it had Mm -hmm. to go through them. So from my experience, that wasn't the best deal for me because I missed out on a a lot of opportunities for those three years that I was in that deal. And that kind of motivated me once I eventually got out of that, you know, just seeing that a lot of these licensing companies, you can sign with them, excuse me, and still be able to work with other licensing companies or other, you know, TV film publishers, Mm. because how they usually structure the deal is a lot of them are going exclusive now. So you, you'll sign an exclusive deal with, you know, ABC licensing company, right? Mm -hmm. So that deal is only for, say, I got two tracks, these two tracks that I'm going to send to them. I can only send those two tracks to them, but I can sit here and make two more tracks and still send those two other tracks to a different, you know, licensing company. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's what I recommend if you're going down the, the TV film route is look for deals that allow you to submit to a, a publisher, but still allow you to work with other publishers. Mm-hmm. Um, so that that's what's been working for me now. You know, I work with with multiple licensing companies, multiple publishers. And, you know, I just select which tracks I want to send to each. Gotcha. So with sync licensing, a lot of times from what I hear, and I don't have any experience in this arena, but it it sounds a lot like it can be a numbers game. You know, what would you say that the batting average is like? Do do you feel like you have to go, is it 100 to 1, 10 to 1 as far as no's to yeses? Um, It is a numbers game and it is. It's hard to keep track. I always say the more you put out, the more you're giving yourself a chance to get placed. Like I see people make five tracks and then put them out and then they don't submit anything because they're just waiting for those five tracks. Mm -hmm. You won't see, you know, success from that. Like you have to continually, continuously, you know, create tracks and then send them and then forget and just keep repeating. Mm -hmm. Um, So when I, when I first started, you know, for that first year, I was creating tracks every week, sending them out um, every week. I would try and do at least five tracks per brief and send those out and just kept my head down, kept working. And then eventually, you know, tracks, I mean, tracks that I did that first year, I'm, I'm seeing placements come in even now um, just from, from stuff I did a long time ago. So you have to just keep going and keep going um, instead of just saying, okay, I did five tracks. I'm going to wait for those five tracks to get placed and then we'll see what happens. You're going to be waiting for about two years <laughs> and then, then you're going to be like, okay, do I want to keep going or, or stop? Or are you going to just be like, it's not worth it. And you're just going to quit and you right. won't see, you know, the fruits of your labor. So that's how I approach it. You know, just try and get as many out there as possible. Absolutely. 
So um, obviously not to get into your pockets, right? But when it comes to licensing, a lot of that money comes in on the back end. Mm -hmm. Uh, So how is it financially feasible to, you know, pursue these music licenses? Yeah, I mean, I always encourage people to have multiple streams of income because music licensing, a lot of it is back end. Like the reality show stuff, you won't see upfront fees is all back end and you won't get paid for shoot the first year and a half, two years from, from the, from the time it actually placed. And then even then, you know, if you get one placement on a reality show, uh, I mean, it could, depending on the network, depending on how it was used, how long it was used, you could see three cents up to hundreds to thousands of dollars. Like it, it ranges like crazy it just depends um so i mean to get it to where you're seeing thousands of dollars every quarter you have to you have to stay consistent for a a solid uh man uh, shoot a solid three years Hmm. at least to uh, three four years even more like it really just depends on how much work you put in and what kind of placements you're getting but yeah you definitely gotta you gotta put in work if you want to see significant income from it Absolutely. Yeah. So what are some of the ways you've been able to diversify your income as you <clears throat> continue this journey? Yeah. So I do music licensing. I do, um, I, I do beats like sell lease beats online. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I do exclusive stuff for independent artists. Um, occasionally if, if there's a major situation that comes across my table, I'll do that. Um, you know, so you get the producer advance whenever the label decides they want to pay you for that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I do courses, I do sound packs, um, consultations and things like that. Just different things to that's all surrounded around music and, and my brand um, and, you know, uh, advertising um, for different brands and things like that. Um, uh, affiliate marketing. So, yeah, it's just a, a bunch of different things. It's all attached to the, the same thing. Got you. So, um I mean, we've talked about your early journey and some of the, the mistakes you made and lessons you've learned. What would you say were some of the, the big successes that you had? Um, man, uh, I would say uh, producing music for um, an Emmy Award winning show that when I was born this way on A&E. It's a mm-hmm. beautiful show um, that kind of... It kind of goes inside the journey of of kids with 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 Down syndrome or young adults with Down syndrome and just how they overcome a lot of the the obstacles that that they come across um, in their lives just as as people. And it was it was a beautiful show, man. So just being able to compose music for that um, and working with, you know, the the head composer closely with that was a dope experience Um, that he kind of allowed me to to even get some some experience producing and scoring to actual picture. Mm. Um, so I think, I think that was a dope accomplishment. Um, and, and then honestly, I think one of the dopest accomplishments in starting this, this road to 10 placements journey has just been able to, to help all the producers that I've been able to help with, with getting placements and, and allowing them to see like, yo, like you can put your music to work um, in a way to where you do the work one time and then you send it out. And literally you're creating passive income Mm. for the rest of your life, you know, uh, from, from something that a lot of people don't know about. Um, So just being able to help, man, so many people with the information and things like that, man, that's, that's probably, that's been like the biggest accomplishment. Right. And I was going to save this for last, but you, 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 you put it right here for me. So let's talk about the, the road to 10 placements tour. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the road to 10 placements tour is pretty much an extension of, of helping as many people as possible, man, get started and getting their music and TV and film and just giving people the tools that they need and the information that they need to get started, not only get started, but to see continual success. You know what I mean? Um, so they're VIP sessions, very small and intimate. Like the slots are limited to, to like at least 15 per city. Mm. And, and what we do, we get together at a studio, you know, you, you send me a few tracks and then we vibe out, we listen to those tracks and then I break them down and let you know exactly like what needs to be worked on. If, if anything needs to be worked on, 
um, so that you can see success with this track and TV and film. Um, so yeah, man, like the one we did in Atlanta was, was super dope, had a lot of dope music, a lot of dope artists, songwriters, publishers, producers, and we just vibe out, man. We share information. Um, we listen to music, share music, and just encourage one another to, you know, to pursue this goal of, of getting our music placed and, and getting paid for our music. Um, so not just music licensing, but we're also covering music production, um, tips and music business tips and things like that, making sure we're taking care of the business end as well. So, um, yeah, man, so that, that kicks off in New York this month, March 28th. And then, um, you know, I'll just be going to another, a new city every month. Um, and just, you know, sharing as much, as much as I can with as many people as I can. Nice. Nice. So, um, if people are interested in joining you on that tour, how do they get more information about it? You can get more information on the Road to Ten Placements tour at clintproductions.com slash tour and all the information will be there. All the cities that are listed um, will be there. And then, you know, if you want your city to be added or you want me to come, um, you, there'll be a number on that website as well where you can text that number and, you know, you text me your name and then we'll get your, your information locked in. Got you. Okay, cool. We've we've covered a lot. Um, just looking here, just making sure we don't leave any stone unturned. Um, yeah. I guess to wrap up, I would say, what's been the the most interesting part of your journey? Maybe a lesson that you learned that you didn't you didn't see coming, or um, an experience that you had that you're just really grateful for. Um. <clears throat> so it would be. I don't, I guess the response of, of just giving information, you know, I started doing consultations and, and teaching people how to get placements and about placements. And honestly, I didn't expect it to have the effect that it had. Like it, it literally kind of came back to me, you know, a hundredfold with opportunities being presented to me um, just from, you know, helping other people. So mm -hmm. I, I didn't, I didn't really expect that when I started the road to 10 placements and sharing my personal experiences and, and doing, you know, vlogs on, on YouTube and things like that. So yeah, it's just been the opportunities that, that come from just sharing and giving back to people, man, it has, has been just phenomenal. Yeah. You know, a lot of the people that I interview, you know, who have put themselves in a teaching role, they give that same feedback. I know that's something that Curtis King talks about a lot as well. You know, mm -hmm. just the unexpected blessing that comes, you know, from being willing to share your knowledge and share your yeah. experience with people. Absolutely, man. Super dope. Well, um, for people who want to stay in touch with you um, after this interview, how can they do that? Um, you can follow me on Instagram. I'm on there a lot, like probably most of the time out of all the social networks. That's at Clint Music, um, C-L-I-N-T-M-U-S-I-C. -I -I and then, of course, you can hit my website, ClintProductions.com. Um, and those, yeah, those are the two, the two main hangout spots. And then you can type Clint Music on YouTube, too. I'll be on YouTube running nice. in my mouth and stuff <laughs> <laughs> cool cool well clint i appreciate your time thank you again for joining us and um i'll make sure i leave all of your links in the description and the show notes of this episode thank you bro thank you for having me man much appreciated no problem <laughs>